Welcome to Ebenezer here today. We're excited that you could join us in, in worship, and whether you're here in person or watching us online, we're glad that you're spending some of your day with us. I also want to uh, thank you for your, your prayers, your care, your concern for uh, my family during the, this time of my passing of my dad last Sunday afternoon, so appreciate that. Please continue to pray. We're having a, a private family gathering here this afternoon. So uh, continue to pray for the Lord's comfort for our, our family. Thank you for doing so. With that, uh, I'd like to read scripture this morning, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 5. And we'll be concluding our look at 2 Corinthians here today. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will have, do what is right, even though we may have seemed to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is for your perfection. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to come to you in worship. I pray, God, that you will speak to our hearts today. Use your word to make sure that none of us fail the test, to be able to answer the question, is Christ in you? May we walk out here today knowing that Christ is in us. And if not, Lord, that you would expose that to us and our need for your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, here we are gathered together to worship. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I loved how uh, raucous we were when we were coming in today. That's good. Let's keep that up. Let's say hello to our neighbor. Maybe you get to say hello this morning. And let's, uh, we're going to be singing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. 
As we read in 2 Corinthians, when we are weak, the Lord is there for us. Let's sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass.
but pass me by. My uh, grandson uh, Jacob took a test this week, a driver's test. And he passed. But let that also be a warning to you. (laughs) Just sing. Well, before we can uh, sing along with Alice Cooper, School's Out for Summer, once again, I'm dating myself. Many uh, high school and uh, college students have to take final exams. I don't know of too many people who look forward to saying, I can't wait to take a final exam. Well, (laughs) For some, it could be the last, well, last one of the year. Anyways, and, you know, you think about why do we take a test? Why do we take an exam? Well, it's to see uh, if you know what you're supposed to know, right? Do you know what you're supposed to know? And just like it's the end of the school year, we have now come to the end of 2 Corinthians. And at the end of the 2 Corinthians, it talks about a final exam. And I'd like you to turn to verse 5. And this particular final exam, this test question, is really the most important test question, really, of all time. Of all time, this is the most important test question. And it says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves do you not realize that christ jesus is in you unless of course you fail the test here the apostle paul is wrapping up his letter to the corinthian church and he has this this pastor's heart to make sure he wants to make sure those in the church are in Christ, that Christ is in them. He wants to make sure they're of the faith. Do they really know Jesus? Can they pass the test? And he tells them that they need to examine themselves. And so this question, even though it was asked 2,000 years ago, is still a question relevant to today for every one of us here today. We need to examine ourselves. We need to test ourselves. And we need to ask the question and be able to have an answer, is Christ in you? Is Christ in you? So in many ways, today's message is a simple message. Simply going to ask the question, is Christ in you? And how do we know if Christ is in you? A time of examination. So I hope that today you can put off what the rest of your day is going to look like and really hone in on this question, is Christ in you? So I'm going to start with the basics and go to what Jesus said in the Gospel according to John chapter 3. And you can turn to John chapter 3 if you'd like. But in John chapter 3, Jesus is having a conversation with a Jewish Pharisee named Nicodemus at night. In another conversation in verse 3 of chapter 3 of John, Jesus tells this Pharisee, and he's telling us, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, or your translation might say this, truly, truly, not just one time, but two, truly, truly, I mean, you better pay attention, Jesus is saying, to what I'm about to say. Truly, truly, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus, and he's telling us, that if we're to see the kingdom, be part of his kingdom, we need to be born again. And this born again is a spiritual birth. It's a spiritual birth. And how do we experience this spiritual birth? Well, Jesus later on 
in his discussion with Nicodemus, tells Nicodemus, and he tells us. Look at the next verses, 14 and 15. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus, first of all, tells Nicodemus, who would have known this particular history and his Jewish history, about this snake lifted in the wilderness. Now, we might not know that history, but it's actually in the scriptures in Numbers 21. If you would look at Numbers 21, you would see what Jesus is referring to. It's something that Nicodemus knew about in their history. And there in Numbers 21, what Jesus told Nicodemus is there was a time when the children of Israel were freed from slavery in Egypt and were out in the wilderness. And they had been in the wilderness for a number of days. And when you're in the wilderness, when you're in the desert, what is desert life like? It's going to be hot. It's going to be lots of sun. There's very little water. There's not a whole lot of food, right? So when you're in the wilderness, when you're in the desert, it's pretty easy to do something, and it's called complain. Complain. And that's what the Jewish people, the, the children of Israel, complained. They complained to Moses. Moses, why did you bring us out into this desert, into this wilderness? We're going to starve to death. It's, it's hot. There's not, you know, we have this manna stuff. There's no water, there's no vegetation, no trees. It's like, it's terrible. Moses, why did you bring us out here? And God heard their complaining, and he was pleased. No, he was not pleased. He sent in their midst poisonous snakes. Now, can you imagine that? How many think, yeah, you're in the desert. There's going to be what? Poisonous snakes. And here there was this, like, all these poisonous snakes came among them, and they started biting the people, and when you get bit by a poisonous snake, what happens? You get really sick, or you might even die. And so now the people, instead of complaining, now they go back to Moses. Moses! Now they plead with Moses. Moses, intercede to God for us. Have the Lord save us, rescue us. And so the Lord told Moses to make a bronze snake, a replica of the snake, make a bronze snake, and fasten it to the top of a pole, and lift that pole up so that the people could see it. And what did the people have to do? If they got bit by a snake, all they had to do, it said, is look to the snake on the pole in faith that you would be healed, and you were what? You were healed. You looked to faith at the snake on the pole, and the poisonous snake, his venom, venom would not harm you, and you would be saved. So Jesus refers to that, and he says, he will be lifted up on a pole. He's looking to the future. In a few short years, he would be lifted on a pole. We call it the cross. And Christ would be put upon the cross. And as Jesus said, those who believe, anyone who believes in me, verse 15, anyone who believes in him, in him, may have eternal life, placing their faith in him. Now, that word believe, in the Greek language, is pistuo. And you can define it as trust, faith. There's also a phrase that I like to use when I talk about this word believe that is used in the scripture, is to be totally committed to someone. It's committing yourself to someone. And what kind of commitment is he talking about? Because see, the Greek word is this idea of total commitment. We oftentimes think of the word believe as something that you mentally have to agree with, right? You mentally have to agree. But it's much deeper than that. It is like totally committing yourself to. Now, one of the best ways to illustrate it is how do we become, you know, you have a boy. You have a girl. And there's this time in their life where they're like eyes meet each other, and pretty soon their, their hearts begin to flutter a little bit. Now, back in the, the Stone Age, when I was in high school, we had class rings. I don't know how many high school students today have class rings, but class rings was a big deal when I went to high school. 
And when you found that special girl in high school, if you were going to be like committed to her, it was called going steady. Big deal. Going steady. It was kind of like, yeah, it's like, we're not going to date anyone else. It's just going to be you and me. And we'd often exchange class rings. The guy would wear the class ring around his neck, kind of show it off as a prize. I'm steady dating her, man. And she would take like a ball of yarn, wrap it around the face. So that the, some of you identify this, right? You did it. You wrapped the yarn around the ring so the guy's ring would fit around your finger. Yes, you did. So there was this somewhat this, this commitment. But it wasn't really total commitment at this point, was it? It was just commitment. Now, eventually, a relationship could grow, and you actually become, what? Engaged. And when you become engaged, now it's, now it's, it's moved up a level, hasn't it? From be, going steady. Now it's like, you're the one, and we're looking forward to getting married to saying, I do, with one another. And oftentimes, in this case, at least for every woman that I know of, except for my wife, you get an engagement ring. I know, she's, I, I'm still trying to make this up for her. I haven't yet. You would think after 40 plus years of marriage, I would somehow get this in my head, but I haven't yet. She still loves me. That's, that's, that's commitment. So any, anyways, you, you have this exchange of a, an engagement ring, and once again, it's like, this, this, this like yeah, we're, we're committed, but you're not yet totally committed, are you? It's not really a total commitment until you have an almost every, I mean, not a, almost every, Every wedding service I have performed with a couple, there's a part where they, what? They exchange rings. They exchange rings. And now there are, we could say that they have moved up and they are now totally committed to one another. This is what Jesus is calling us to when he uses the word, you have to believe in me. Do you see the depth of it? It's not just a mental deal. This is total commitment. He says you have to believe in me. It's committing yourself to him. A commitment. It's a saying, I do to Christ. It's that particular idea. And then you become born again. And saying, I do to Christ. So that's one passage. Jesus himself talks about you can pass the test Examine yourselves. Make sure that you pass the test that Christ is in you. And it starts here with this being born again. Believing in him. Being totally committed to Christ. Now there's another scripture we can look at. And it's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And this gives us some very important clues also of what it means to have Christ in you. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says that... Uh, for it is by grace that you are saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works that no man, no person should boast. Here we see that we're saved by what? Grace. We're saved by grace. We're not saved by works. Works is human effort. And sometimes we as humans can get in our idea in our heads that if we do something for God, like, hey, I'll, you know, maybe I can't be to church 52 weeks out of the year, but I'll be there 40 times. God will certainly credit my account for that. Or maybe he'll, he'll, you know, God, look at the amount of money that I give. Certainly that work is something to you, isn't it? Or how about that community service? All that is works. You're saved by grace. And, and grace I, is, is something, I, I'll give you this particular story that helps me understand grace. Many of us are familiar with 9-11. New York City, the Twin Towers. And there's actually, this particular story was actually made into a movie. But there's a particular story where two Port Authority police officers were trapped underneath 30, 30 feet deep of debris. Basically, the towers came down upon them, and they were trapped 30 feet under rubble. And they could do nothing, absolutely nothing, to rescue themselves. They could absolutely do nothing to save themselves. And it wasn't until an ex-Marine by the name of 
Dave Carnes. He heard about this on the radio, what had happened. And Dave Carnes is a committed Christian, committed follower of Christ. And he thought, he got this impression in his, in his heart that he needed to go. And he needed to go and see if anybody survived, and he was going to be a part of the rescue effort to see if anyone survived the collapsing of the towers upon them. So he went, he went to his barber and said, give me a Marine haircut. This guy had been in the Marines for 23 years. Give me a Marine haircut. He wanted to look the part. He went to his home. He always had two pressed Marine uniforms in his closet. He put one of them on. He then went to his, his gearbox, and he took out a flashlight and his knife and so forth. And then, he, and then as he was driving towards New York City to the Twin Towers, he stopped at his church. And the church was having a prayer meeting. It was a 9-11. A lot of churches did this when that happened. It was his church, and he went to the pastor, and the people said, pray for me. I'm going there, and I'm going to see if anybody's alive. So they're, they're, the church is praying for him. So he takes his, he just bought this brand new 911 Porsche, called 911 Porsche. Isn't that interesting? 911 Porsche. Puts the top down, in his military uniform, military haircut, he thinks, I'll get past all the checkpoints. And he does. He does. And then he ends up with meeting another Marine. He starts, he and this other Marine, they start walking amongst the rubble, just saying, if anyone's there, say something, yell! And eventually they heard the voice of two men, Will and John, Port Authority police officers. They heard the voice, found them, and then they called a rescue team in to get them out. It was only because of the rescue team that they could be rescued, that they could be saved. Will, the police officers, Will and John, they couldn't, they couldn't rescue themselves. They could not save themselves. It was by grace, really, that they were found and that a team was able to dig them out of 30 feet of rubble so that they would live. This is the grace that Christ gives us. We cannot save ourselves. We, couldn't, we cannot get out on our own. It is like the poisonous snake of sin has bit us. It is like the rubble of the Twin Towers has fallen down upon us. There is nothing that we can do. It's only what Christ has done on the pole, on the cross for us, that we can have grace. You want to be saved? You want to be rescued? You can't do it on your own. It's like the opening lines of the, of the hymn, Amazing Grace says, Amazing Grace, how sweet this sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found because of Christ. So examine yourselves. Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourself. Is Christ in you? And I want you to be able to walk out of here this morning making sure making sure, if there is any doubt in you, making sure that you can answer this question, is Christ in you in the affirmative? And say, yes, I've been born again. I've looked to Christ in faith, believing in him, committed to him and what he has done for me on the cross so that I can be rescued by his grace. Examine yourself. And, and really, when it, the, the test question, is Christ in you, is simply answered in the first letter of John. John also wrote some other letters. And in 1 John, the fifth chapter, he writes this. He really tells us how to answer the test question as we examine our lives. If you look there in John chapter 5, 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, starting verse 11, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. There it is. You pass the test. 
is Christ in you when you have the Son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. Life is found in the Son. And then, I want you to make sure, and notice what the next verse says. This is the assurance verse. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe, now again, believe is what? Committed to. The one who is committed to Christ in faith. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. It doesn't say I have to guess. Well, maybe I think so, or I really, I hope so, but it says I can know so. I can know so, because it's not what I do, it's what Christ has done on the cross. And then I have Christ in me. There was a time uh, when I was doing campus life ministry, we would, Sunday afternoons uh, during the winter, we would have, uh, we would play basketball at the Pandora High School gym. And uh, during our time of uh, playing a, a basketball, yeah, when I was younger, I could do that. I can't so much now. But anyways, uh, we'd, we'd take a, a time out in the middle of our time playing basketball, and I would have uh, one of the guys share their faith story about, about Jesus, share their, share their testimony. And there was this particular week, and I'd always ask the guy the week before, so it's not like I'd just spring on him and say, hey, come on up here and tell us your faith story. You know, how did you come to know Jesus? So I asked this guy, I said, next week I want you to share during our time out here during our basketball games. Well, I made an assumption. I made an assumption, and it was a wrong assumption. I made the assumption that this guy knew Jesus. I mean, hey, he, he went to church, he came to Campus Life, I'm thinking automatically, hey, this guy knows Jesus. Well, the nice thing is this young man, he knew that he was going to have to give a story, and he's thinking, this really prompted him to examine himself. Do I have Jesus in my life? Is Christ in me? And guess what his answer was? No, I don't. I really don't know Jesus. I've not believed in him. But you know what the rest of the story is? He ended up by Sunday afternoon, the next week, he had a story. Just by asking him to share your faith story, realizing, examine himself, he didn't have one. But that prompted him to like, I need to get serious about this. And so he was able to share that. He said, hey, guess what, guys? This week, I believed in Christ. I came to know Christ as my Savior. So that's, you know, again, I don't want to make any assumptions about you. You know, if I said, hey, come on up here, give your face story. Hey, why don't, you, why don't you come on up here? Would you be able to? Again, examine yourselves. Make sure you pass the most important test question you'll ever have to answer. Is Christ in you? Have you believed in Christ? Do you know that you have eternal life because of Christ? So let's pause for a moment. Let's just pause for a moment. Ask yourself the test question right now. Do as the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church. Do this for yourself. Examine yourself. Is Christ in you? you. If I just pointed at you and said, come on up and tell us about your story in Christ, would you be able to come and tell us? If you're not sure, you can walk out here sure today. You can walk out here sure today because that's what the scripture says. Those who have the Son have eternal life. I've written to these things to you that you may know, know you have eternal life. So I'm going to be quiet for a little bit. Let Jesus speak to you. Let this scripture speak to you. Examine yourself. Look at the test question. Is Christ in you? And if he's not, or if you're not sure, make sure. It's the spirit tugging at your heart. Come to him.
Lord, we want to just pause right now and I pray for each and every, every one here today that they examine themselves before you. Lord, might each and every one of us today walk out of this time of worship knowing they have answered the question, Christ in you, and we say, yes, Christ is in me. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. We pray, Lord, for those who have believed in you, have committed themselves to you, so they have the assurance of salvation, knowing that they have eternal life. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's another part to this, and we're, I really wanted to focus on this most important test question. The rest of the questions, the next question, actually, the next, there's another question here at the end of the chapter. I'm only going to spend a few minutes on this because our, our, our time is up. And, and really, this particular question comes after the most important test question. But it's here. Another test question is, is, is this, is the Apostle Paul says to the church, here are some steps. You need to be growing in Christ. And your translation will either use the word perfection or mature, like growing into maturity. Um, and he gives us these ways in which we can, can grow in Christ. And, and in fact, as Jesus himself said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So Jesus is saying that once someone comes to him, believes in him, they're to be like him. And there's this process where to, where to, to grow in Christ. And at the end of the 2 Corinthians, this, the end of the chapter, the end of the story, so to speak, actually, the Apostle Paul gives seven steps to maturity. Here they are. And I think I even gave a, a place on your, if you're following along in your handout, you can actually write these down. I'm not going to really go into them in depth. But one thing that I want you to notice, which is really, really, really important, is this. Because it's, because what's up here is countercultural. This is countercultural. Our culture is so much into meism, and the scriptures and Jesus points us to weism. We leave the meism, our selfishness, and we come to Christ, and now it's about loving God and loving others. Our culture is really good at loving ourselves. <laughs> really good. Extremely good. Christ calls us to love God and love others. And here he talks about how we're to be in a faith community, a community called the church, because that's who he's writing to. He's writing to the Corinthian church. And he says, here's what needs to take place. This is what needs to take place in your lives as a church. And I think what, what also, as, as he talks about this idea of, of a maturity, of and, that, and that's what the, the word, if, you're, if your scripture uses the word perfection, it doesn't mean that you're going to become perfect. Sorry to spoil the rotten news there. But it's all about be growing. It's maturing. It's growing up in the faith. Christ expects us to believe in him, and then there's this expectation once Christ is in us that we're going to grow, and we're going to grow together. Together. And so I want to encourage you that we're to be more like ears than we are like skulls. Now, what does that mean? For some of you, you're not going to like this information I'm going to give you. But throughout our lives, your ears are always going to get bigger. Some of you might be encouraged by that. Others of you might not. There's a couple reasons why. is because it's cartilage, not bone. And also because gravity is working against you. Man, gravity's been working against me for a long time now. And, and any, anyways, your ears are going to get, they're always going to get bigger. Your skull, on the other hand, once you reach puberty, is set. It's not going to get any bigger. So what the Apostle Paul and what Jesus is calling to us is to be an ear, not a skull. He wants us to always keep growing in the faith, maturing, growing together as his church family. And as we grow together, and I conclude on this, is imagine if there was a time, and 
this is a, this is a classic question. This, class, this question has been around a long time. For some of you, it's like, I've heard this one 100 times. Well, I know I have, 101 now. And it's this, if you were put on a trial for being a disciple of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence to convict you? As you're growing in Christ, you're, you're surrendering the cultural impact of meism and instead going to the we where we're going to love God and love others in a church body that helps us to be able to answer the question in the affirmative. If you were put on trial for being a disciple of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So may we go out today in assurance that Christ is in you. You've examined yourself. Christ is in you. Know that in Christ you have eternal life. And now go and be a big ear. Grow those ears. Keep on growing. Mature, keep maturing in the faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your scripture is clear that there are times where we need to take exams, where there's a time where we take a test. And that most important test question is Christ in you. And we pray, God, that because that question has been asked, and you have provided the answer to that, that we have surrendered our lives to you, that we have believed, that we have committed our life to you in faith. And then, Lord, we ask that we might grow. Let our ears get big in the aspect that we're maturing in the faith together as a church here at Ebenezer. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for your, our challenge this morning. And uh, we're going to close with two songs, one from each section of, of uh, our final exam. Do we, do we know that Christ is in us, and then are we growing? So won't you stand and let's sing, His Mercy is More. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more.
Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. All right, let's sing Just a Closer Walk with the... walk with you this is our prayer that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of christ 
filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen.